Thank you, Noel, and thank you to both of the societies for the invite. Um, I'm going to have a time problem because that's on GMT and that is. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I've got two hours. Um, and we know we've got to be out of the building by 7 o'clock. So by quarter to seven, you just keep shouting and then stop. And the way it's going to work tonight is I'm going to do a quick introduction, and then Michael's going to focus on Yemen, and then you. So it's kind of I'm the starter. That's the main course, and then there's a bit of dessert in Oman, uh, which is to do with the aerial archaeology there. Um, and probably the other thing to say is I normally start things with a joke. Maybe I shouldn't because we're being filmed. Um, this is a really big subject. It's a very important subject. Uh, very difficult to cover in 45 minutes to an hour and it reminds me of a cartoon I saw once where there's two hobbits in a pub and one hobbit says to the other, to cut a long story short, I threw the ring in the fire. So you're going to get the shortened version. So if you've read Lord of the Rings you know what I'm talking about, if you haven't I've just spoiled it for you. Um, so in ancient archaeology, and Noel got it right, I've got an archaeological friend who is dyslexic and he said, Bob, what's this project enema? It's Emina, and when we were sitting in the uh, office on the first day of the project, because we're funded by Arcadia, and it was 2015, and somebody said, what are we going to call the project? And I said, well, what about Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa? Because that was the title of the bid that we put in. And it seemed to work, it seems to have stuck, and that's fantastic. Um, we won't talk too much about the Cultural Protection Fund project today, although we will mention it, because it, we, one of the objectives is to create national heritage inventories across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but having got the Arcadia funding, which has now will, will have kept us going for five years, in 2016 the Cultural Protection Fund uh, was created and we applied with a view to training heritage professionals in Arab countries in the Middle East and North Africa and were successful and they've now given us over two million pounds and those training projects are happening as we speak and that project comes to an end in uh, January 2020. Um, when we designed the project I imagined it would be a relatively small project and a small number of people working in a small office somewhere in Oxford. It has grown and grown and grown so that we now have, if you look on our website, over 35 people involved um, in, as you can see there, five different universities. So we've got Oxford, Leicester, Durham, and very recently, also funded by Southampton, uh, funded by Arcadia, are Southampton and Ulster. And Southampton and Ulster will be focusing on the maritime archaeology of the Middle East and North Africa. So it is getting bigger and bigger, and uh, we need to think about what to do about that. Um, if somebody said to me, would you do the same project if you could start again? I would probably say no, but we've started. And when we put in the proposal to Arcadia, it was everything from Mauritania to Iran. That is massive. It's so don't ask me detailed questions about the archaeology of any specific country, because I won't know the answer. Even though I've worked in Jordan for 20 years, um, that is one little bit of my expertise. And one of the problems about being an aerial archaeologist is that you either know nothing about anything or a very little bit about a lot. Uh, because you have, when you're flying around or even looking at satellite imagery, you have to make a decision of is it archaeology and what date is it? And it doesn't matter if it's 50 years old or 50,000 years old. You're going to make a record of it. And then you've got to ask somebody who is an expert on both that geography and that period. So that's why we describe it as a voyage of discovery and documenting damage and destruction. And the other D might be and it becomes very depressing when you see a lot of archaeology that's been destroyed. But in doing this presentation, Michael and I um, said, well, what's the focus in terms of Yemen? So one of the focuses there is new discoveries, things that we wouldn't have seen before and may have never been seen before either, which is part of the excitement of being an archaeologist. And there it is just in summary, discovering archaeological sites, monitoring change. And part of what the, the, the stimulus for the project um, was that there's so much change going on in the world anyway, uh, but especially in the Middle East and North Africa. And what I, should, what I should have said over that first slide is that the stimulus was the conflict in Syria and also Iraq. And Arcadia said, what could we do about this? And one of the answers to uh, the destruction that was going on is you have to make a record of what's there before you can understand what's being destroyed. And also you need to make a record before other things are destroyed. 
And uh, as archaeologists, we don't think that we know that we can't preserve everything. So by recording it, you're then able to at least have made a record of it, and then someone can make a decision about that destruction. And then the final thing we're doing is an assessment of the threats and the damage that, that, that is, is either happening at the site or likely to happen at the site. This slide and the next slide is really just to show that endangered archaeology, although it's not a phrase we used to use in Britain, um, we would norm, normally say heritage at risk or whatever else, is not the monopoly of the Middle East and North Africa. We have been damaging our archaeology in Britain for probably two, three hundred years, and also right across Europe. It's nothing new. Um, but what I wanted to show was a site that you're all familiar with, Stonehenge. Um, and I just saw something on Twitter today, which was brilliant. It said, and it was a sign somebody saw on the way to work. It said, Stonehenge, built by immigrants. I think that was a reference to Brexit. Um, and that's an interesting point, wasn't it? Um, and this is just showing Stonehenge. It's partly to make the point, too, about historic air photographs, which Mike is going to talk about again. Um, this is taken from an army balloon in 1906. Very important in, in terms of the history of aerial archaeology, which is of another lecture, because you've got the vegetational change between the bank and the ditch, and that's the grass growing darker. Um, and it was not until probably 20 years after this published and archaeologists began to realize that they were looking at vegetational change. The reason I'm showing it is because you can see the damage being done by the army and the fact that the stones are falling down. These are uh, wooden supports holding up the stones. So you have to monitor, keep monitoring sites and there's a photograph of it in 2017. Um, obviously in 1906 this road didn't exist. It existed for many, many years, the A344, and is now closed. And it's taken a lifetime to get that road closed. But even so, you've got to then monitor the visitors. There's a, there's, so Stonehenge will always change. And if you've been following the press, there's a big discussion about the Stonehenge Tunnel. I did make a vow when I moved south, which was never to get involved in Stonehenge. Um, and I've been in the house that we live in in Wiltshire literally three weeks, and Chris Chippendale emailed me and said, Bob, can you come to Stonehenge? And that was that. I got involved in Stonehenge. Um, just wanted to mention, uh, as Noel did in the introduction, about the Aerial Archaeology in Jordan project. It's, it's partly the result, the Indonesian Archaeology project grew out of the Aerial Archaeology in Jordan project in a way. The brainchild of Professor David <coughs> Kennedy, he'd been working in Jordan 10, 15 years and been trying to get uh, into the air. And in fact, through the help of Tricia, who's in the audience, uh, Tricia Salty, uh, she was able to introduce him to the air attaché, I believe it was at the time, uh, Mike Sedman. And between them, they managed to convince the Jordanian Air Force to take him flying. David went for a flight, and then he emailed me and said, Bob, would, I, would, I, would you come over and give me a hand? And we thought it would be a two, three-year project. It's now been a 22-year project, as you can see. This will be our 23rd year, if we can get uh, funding to do it. And all the photographs are on the Apalmy website, if you want to take a note of that. There's over 100,000 images, and it's a combination of aerial photographs that we've taken, maps and everything else. So when Arcadia were chatting with Andrew Wilson, who's the professor of the archaeology of the Roman Empire at Oxford University, they said, do you know anybody who might be interested to create a project that would look at satellite imagery, imagery to rapidly record endangered archaeology? Andrew said, yes. What about Paul and David? Uh, so that was how a proposal uh, was drafted and we ended up doing what we were doing. This is just one photograph of that 100,000 that I wanted to share with you. And it's one of my favorite because it doesn't matter how much preparation you do and how much flying you do, every now and again, you, the serendipity plays a part. We were looking for a site near this one. We couldn't find it. We were five miles from the airfield marker in, in Amman. Um, which is not a good place to be if you're orbiting because there's lots of other planes coming in and out. And we photographed the site, and as you can see, it's a Roman quarry. And what I love about it is that you can see that there's all bits of these drums and columns in various stages of extraction. So there they've marked out where they might cut it. There's a square one, these are round ones. And you can imagine at some point, 
in, in what might be, I guess, the late Roman period, but the guys are standing there going, we're not going to get paid, are we? It's all over. We've done all this work, and, excuse my French, the Romans have bugged it off. And um, you might have to edit that bit out, sorry. Um, where did they, and no one knew about the site. It wasn't on the national record. This, we think, is the, well, we know it's the first ever aerial photograph. We don't know if there are any other ground photos. We've since discovered, when we visited on the ground, we found there's another one just over the hill. Um, I've tried to go back and re-photograph it, but every time we go, we're not allowed to because there's somebody landing at the airfield and therefore we've got to go on and do something else. But it just shows that even though we've got all the satellite imagery and we've been working 20 years, you'll still find new stuff, um, which is untouched. And the reason this is important is that uh, that's where it is in terms of a Google Earth pin. This is the quarrying, modern quarrying, because everybody who lives in Jordan and Amman wants to have their houses built of lovely limestone. And that's the processing area and the site's there. It won't be long before those two join up. And so it really has got to be protected. And so we are working with the Department of Antiquities. And it would be, although I'm not a Roman archaeologist, I think it would be great to do an excavation there to find out you know, what they had for their last meal before they all went off as unemployed people in the late Roman period. Um, other stories as well that really reinforce the point about how endangered the archaeology is. Uh, this is down in the south of Jordan near Ma'an. There were three of these, whatever we want to call them, caravanserai, very important um, archaeological sites, all connected by a wall, and there's also, uh, we think these are early Islamic, but there's also a Roman aqueduct system nearby, and as you can see, there's a lot of activity going on. And we've been monitoring this site, many sites, over and over again. This was it in October 2018. It's the same site. You can see the olive trees are being grown, and the, the, obviously they need water for the olive tree, so what do you do? Find the nearest source of, of, of stone. Doesn't matter that it's a very important early Islamic site, but it's protected by the Jordanian law. Pile it up, put your water tanks on there, and you can water the olives. Apparently the olives don't taste very nice, um, and it's the wrong place to grow olives. But the rumor has it that they got a grant from the EU to build their olive plantation. But anyway. Um, other examples here that we knew about, sites that we knew, um, very important, uh, the Parthian city of, of Hatra. It is a World Heritage site, isn't it? Yeah, it is, that's what I thought so. Um, I was just trying to double check it the other day. And it's now on the endangered list. And these are photographs that were taken by Sir Oral Stein and the RAF in the 1930s. And it's a series of photographs that have been stitched together. Um, published by Bradford in a book called Ancient Landscapes in 1957. And um, you can see the outer wall and the inner wall there. But you'll remember this is where ISIS and Daesh went in and destroyed a whole lot of material. And, they, and the news report was, Hatra has been destroyed. Well, the good news is that Hatra hasn't been destroyed. And it's not to diminish the damage that was done, which was done in there. Um, and this is a satellite image from 2015. And there's now a colleague from, um, funded through the NAPRE network who's working on this, on this area and this project to try and come up with a management plan for the whole city of, of Hatra. But you can see if you, if you look at the difference between the two sites, or sorry, the two images, which is why it's important to have this historic air photographs, um, you can see that the small town has, been, has grown up here, there's a main road. Um, you wouldn't be able to visit it on the ground because it's under the protection of an armed group. But the armed group are actually protecting it from anybody, uh, any other armed groups that might come and want to get rid of them. We have heard they may transfer it over to the Iraqi army, which I think would be a good thing. Um, so how do we do what we do? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, 20 countries, 10 <coughs> million square kilometers. Whose idea was that? Um, we divide it up into grid squares, and what we're recording are sites, landscapes, and monuments of any date, of any description. And people like to say, oh, it's a comprehensive survey. And I always argue that there's no such thing as a comprehensive archaeological survey. You can do a survey with the best techniques you've got, which is just what you can do at this moment in time. You will never find everything. And the other thing is that other things become archaeology 
that 10, 15 years ago wouldn't have been. So the archaeology of the First World War is fairly common to us in Europe, but only fairly recent in the Middle East and North Africa. And there's been a, a project called the Great Arab Revolt Project looking at the archaeology of, of really from 1915 to 1920. And it's a really important project. Sadly, the, in Jordan, for example, the law is that, that nothing later than 1750 can be protected because of under their law, it, 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 that, that's the cutoff date. They're trying to get the law changed, but, but these things take time. Anyway, back to the Endangered Archaeology Project. Um, we have recorded, or we have 252,000 records. That's not sites, that's records. Uh, in this database, there isn't time in this talk to talk, talk too much about the database, but it's basically recording the, it's recording the basic information about a site uh, in terms of the location, size, what we think it is, what date we think it is, and not surprisingly, there's an awful lot of unknowns because it's very difficult to date sites that don't have a particular signature, maybe slightly amorphous, could be any date, could be anything from prehistory right up to the 19th century. And that's not necessarily a failing of archaeology. I think it would be wrong if we said, we're certain that dates from the 15th century when actually we don't know whether it's 15th century AD or BC. Much better to say, we don't know. Um, and that was, that was a lesson we learned when we were doing the National Mapping Program for English Heritage as well. Uh, we're using bespoke software. Our funders, um, <coughs> Arcadia, suggested we use this Archie software. Uh, developed by the Getty Conservation Institute and World Monument Fund because a lot of the thinking had been done. It was a ready-made uh, platform that we could build our information on. Um, the purpose of it is for research and heritage management. We haven't time today to talk about the national and regional databases that we want to create, but when we first envisaged the project, I never thought the database might be used by anybody but ourselves. But a lot of the countries said, we want to use your database, and we want to develop it for our own purposes. And Michael mentioned that for Yemen. And at the moment, the three countries that have made the, the biggest journey on that road are Jordan, Palestine, and Yemen. But we have heard that possibly Iraq are interested. Uh, we know the Libyan archaeologists are interested, but just at the moment, Libya is going through even more trouble than we might have expected. Um, and the Tunisians also have said they're interested. Open access. Now, our funders are very, very keen on open access. And in the end, we had to say, well, what does open access mean? And what they really mean by that, which is very good of them to say this, which is it's not commercial. So we're not selling anybody the information, but any bona fide student, archaeologist, historian, geographer, anybody who's interested can get access to all the information. The, the general public can get a certain amount of information because we've got to be sensitive that it's not our country's it's not our data, it's not our archaeological sites, it's other people's, uh, but equally we want people to know about it. And uh, then very quickly, just the five main areas of damage and destruction, conflict obviously, um, looting, construction and agriculture, and those are the two major ones. Because of population rise, the greater the population, the more you've got to feed and house and have have um, supplies of water. <coughs> so those are the two major ones. Um, and natural erosion, which is a, perhaps a euphemism for climate change, I think that's going to be the focus as we go forward in the project, assessing the impact of climate change on the cultural heritage. Um, and then my final few slides, just to show <coughs> the impact looting can have on one site in Syria during erosion. Um, the only damage done to this archaeological site has been done by archaeologists, so it's under controlled conditions. That's a satellite image from 2011, same site in 2014, and although this screen's a bit bright, every black dot is a looted either pit. So all the external cemetery, every single building inside Jewry or Opus has been uh, looted one way or another. And then this one, it doesn't, it should say the date, Christmas Day 2015, um, just reinforcing how much damage has been done. So that is on a massive scale. And that was done <coughs> under ISIS control, and somebody had made a lot of money out of that. And that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. But I will be back to talk about Oman. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, what time would you like to be back to talk about Oman? Doesn't matter. 
because if you're stunningly interesting, I should be very quick on her mind. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and the uh, opportunity to speak to you here today. Um, so what I'm going to speak about our work specifically in Yemen. Uh, Bob mentioned that first day, thinking what, what have we done all these countries. Originally Yemen wasn't, back in the 1st of January or whenever in 2015, Yemen wasn't going to be one of our so initial... 12th of January. We were working January. on the 1st of January. Okay. Um, it wasn't going to be uh, a focus of our research. Uh, and I think it's a testament both to Bob as a director, but also the freedom that Arcadia gave us to undertake this project. They gave us a very broad remit that by, I think, probably March 2015, myself, my colleague Andrew, Andrea Zabini, uh, and also our other colleague Rebecca Banks, were able to approach Bob and say, Can we have a rethink? We were working a lot in uh, the eastern desert of Egypt at that time, but we said, Can we divert attention to Yemen? Um, in terms of our team, that was a bit ridiculous. We didn't have any background between any of us working in Yemen. You could say that the UK in general doesn't have a, a particularly strong tradition in terms of archaeological research in Yemen, despite um, its uh, history with uh, the Aden Protectorate. Uh, but we went ahead because it was another developing war zone. We didn't know what was going to happen, and obviously we were looking at what had happened in Iraq and Syria I'm wondering, would we see the same again? And certainly in the early stages of the conflict, um, we had a lot to worry about. This is um, Barrakeesh. Uh, this is uh, an image from probably uh, early 2016. I very foolishly thought I'd have a monitor with all my notes here, but I'm going to have to try and remember the days of the day. And we can see the, uh, the old Italian camp has been hit by an airstrike, as well as the reconstructions of the temple. Uh, a Barrakeesh uh, by a GCC coalition airstrike. And this happened at a number of sites, uh, including the Citadel of Taiz, uh, and also the reconstruction of the dam and, and Marie. Um, so that was a big worry at the beginning. Um, as the conflict has panned out, there has been continued issues, but nothing like, say, on a general scale, what we've seen in Syria and Iraq. We have an issue that we just it's much harder to get intelligence from the ground. Uh, from our colleagues in Yemen, it's very difficult for people working in the government to travel around and observe sites on the ground. But we're not seeing the same kind of ideological destruction of sites uh, across the conflict, and also that, that growth of looting. Although we know a number of museum sites have been uh, looted, and a lot of those artifacts have appeared uh, on the world market. In terms of those, those kind of looting pits that we saw during Europas in Syria, there is a baseline of looting that goes on in Yemen, but we are not <coughs> seeing that, at least from satellite imagery, increasing. It might be happening in different ways that only over time we'll start to understand. So that's the, that's the, the, the kind of conflict background to our work there. But as Bob said, we're going to focus today on new discoveries. A kind of more positive aspect of us transferring our attention to Yemen is that by using these new methodologies of using satellite imagery to survey areas that hadn't really been surveyed archaeologically uh, in the past has meant that we're identifying whole new archaeological landscapes that previously were not documented. They may exist uh, in terms of local knowledge on the ground uh, and maybe in some cases in paper records uh, with the General Organization of Antiquities and Museums, the National Authority in Yemen, in terms of I think uh, our director, um, our project lead, Andrew Wilson, uses the, uh, the term known to science. They were not known to science in terms of uh, our understanding of the region. So I'm going to back to it. Now going forwards. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two regions uh, just to give you a snapshot because we have identified a lot of either very clearly archaeological sites or potentially archaeological sites uh, across Yemen. Um, so I'm just going to give you a snapshot of two regions where, particularly in the last 12 months, we've developed some uh, very interesting data. Uh, and it really is just going to be a snapshot, so uh, you'll have to follow up after the talk. Um, and after that, I'm also going to mention our work with historical area of photography uh, and our work training archaeologists uh, from the go out of the general organization of these museums. So first, I'm going to look at some work we've done in the Tiara Plain uh, on the um, west coast of Yemen. Uh, generally, in terms of satellite imagery, the plane itself is not a great place to survey. Um, sites don't show up well. 
and there's been a lot of intensification of agriculture, which means it's, it's very difficult to pick out archaeological sites. Occasionally, we come up with some kind of some gems, uh, and this really emphasizes how, in using aerial archaeology or remote sensing archaeology, some things will be visible in some images and some uh, not in others. So here is a, a site from the very north of the Tiara Plain. Um, you see the mangrove uh, forest in the sea, so we're right up on the coast. Can't really see much in this image. But in the next image, you see suddenly, hopefully you can all make out. This is it's actually fantastic. We've got this great screen. Usually we have a projector, and I just have to tell people just to, to assume that I'm telling the truth and I'm putting something out. You can see the square enclosure with circular towers uh, on each corner, almost square, but not quite. So a coastal port, probably you know, mid-Islamic in date, maybe 15th, 16th century. So, I mean, I can't even believe that I managed to spot this, because we, we, do, we do survey quite quickly, uh, uh, and we managed to pick this one out. So these are, in that region, we, you don't see much, but occasionally you come up with something good. And then, a kind of a hot off the press thing. I remember when I, when I identified this site, that there was another fort still standing nearby, so I, I, I went to that one. So this is just north of uh, Midi, so really near the, um, the border of Saudi Arabia. And here we see a fort, not quite similar, it's a lot more square, and we have these projecting towers, and opposing corners, probably cannon towers, so probably uh, 17th century fort, something like that, with some ongoing occupation in the site. So this is an image from uh, 2011. Uh, and then when I came back to the site, I left it, and this is a problem with monitoring the satellite imagery. You can identify a site, you can assess its condition at that time, but particularly using something like Google Earth, where a new imagery is added, we don't have the people, the resources, to follow up and check again and again. So it was only two days ago when I came back to check this site that I saw, by 2017, we'd seen the occupation of the site through our military forces. You see trenches dug across, and you see the telltale signs of airstrikes with this splurging material from the structures. And the site, whilst archaeologically not destroyed, very badly damaged. <coughs> Michael, what date was the previous image? The previous image was 2011, so it's happened some point between 2011 and 2017, but we assume probably, like many heritage sites that were affected in the early stages of the conflict, uh, particularly with this being so near the northern border of uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia. Um, but I will, from now on, try and avoid these kind of depressing images of Bob Talk. I'm going to say a phrase, but I won't. So now we're going to move further south near the town of um, Hayes. And so where the archaeology becomes a lot more visible in terms of remote sensing is where you get to the foothills at the edge of the plain. Uh, working in the area, came across this site. At first, it, it just seemed kind of unrecognizable. I could see a lot of, you can see a lot of buildings, structures all in this area. We also had this, this bank around the, uh, the north side of it with a smaller one coming through and a larger one system cutting across the north side. And I thought, this, this, this must be a documented site. It looks more and more like a rampart of a very large settlement. We also have this terrace with structures as you move up the mountainside. But it wasn't. It was a, it's a new, newly documented site, as far as we can tell. In terms of date, again, we're guessing it could be South Arabian, so late 1st millennium BC into 1st millennium AD, maybe it's later. It certainly doesn't look like your Islamic towns like Zabid or Mocha. Um, but we don't know. It's a, it's a new discovery. And this doesn't happen often that you find something quite cliche dramatic, but occasionally it does. So that was very exciting. So this is an image from 2004. And again, just highlighting where the rampart is, again, using that wadi. Pay attention to that, because that will come up again in a moment. Um, this is taken with Google Earth, you can take an oblique angle using a very basic photogrammetric system in Google Earth to give an idea of topography. So now, uh, was there a point about that? There's a, there's a cursor you might be able to use. Oh, sorry, I thought there was a point to that. Don't worry, I will just point with my hand. Um, so now you see the rampart at the bottom of the mountain here. You can also see just about, actually this is one where you'll have to take my word for it, there is a structure just here at the very top of the mountain. So you have this major settlement, this terracing with structures here, and then right at the top of the mountain, another structure. 
pay attention to this area on the side. So this is 2004. In 2007, if this P work, we see a very crude but very extensive probably a quarrying episode has occurred down this side. If that had happened here, that side would have gone, I probably never would have identified it. So our whole, let's say city, for, for sake of argument, would have gone. And luckily, that was a one-off episode. The quarry didn't seem to continue in use. We have seen continuing agricultural use of the site, uh, with a few more fields being added uh, to the area. But I mean, we were talking about this before, how Yemen, in many ways, it has this amazing, this, this breadth of archaeology, of heritage, so many sites. And although they suffer kind of a, a slow sense of degradation, because Yemen has suffered so much economically over the decades, it hasn't hasn't been subject to the same kind of rampant economic growth that we've seen elsewhere in Arabia, so that many of its sites survive. And this is often what we see when we see damage. We see small-scale individual farms adding a few fields or a few more buildings. It's only in a few areas we've seen kind of rapid economic development that often leads to the damage of sites. And we don't want to stop that development. We want to see Yemen develop. But we want to see it develop in a sustainable way where we can, where we can use data sets like ours to guide uh, development, whether it's agriculture, whether it's towns, whether it's uh, mining uh, or oil extraction. <clears throat> so that was one site. I thought that was pretty remarkable. I'm not going to get anything like that again, but further north along the plain, um, another one. Different this time, we're not up against the mountain, but we have a major wadi system and a minor wadi system coming in. And again, highlighting what appears to be another rampart around some sort of citadel on a slightly raised area, a modern-ish modern cemetery, possibly using an older cemetery, this time without all the structures inside. We've got much denser agriculture, but a few buildings are still surviving. And what was really interesting, with that last site, I, I kept asking myself, is that really a rampart? Whereas this site, if we look down at the southern end, we have a bit more evidence in terms of these two uh, inverted towers almost certainly a gateway, <coughs> some sort of outer defence uh, area here. So I suddenly felt a lot more reassured about the last site, even though we didn't have that plethora of buildings internally. But again, we're looking at another possible city site again. I take the same data as the other site, but as soon as I don't know the date of the other site, then we'll have to stay guessing on that. And then as you move up into the, to the kind of the foothills along the sides of the Tiamat Plain, you, you're getting other kind of interesting things coming through, certainly around this area, we're seeing what looks like new kind of cemetery uh, evidence in terms of uh, types of cairns that I've not seen before. But again, this is all data. This is kind of the, the first stage of survey. This, this needs to be researched further on the ground. And that's hopefully where it will be taken in terms of our, our partnerships with the government. The other area I want to quickly talk about now is the kind of border region between um, Damar and Al-Beda. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of research in Damar in terms of the work of uh, Tony Wilson, Wilkinson's research uh, with the Damar uh, Regional Survey and the Oriental Institute in Chicago. But this region, bordering the two areas, hasn't been looked at quite so much. Uh, and it's interesting because of a lot less agriculture in the area. And what kind of piqued my interest in this is that I was looking at a Dutch survey of uh, the area around Benin in uh, the north area of Denmark. And uh, in 1998, uh, as part of, I suppose, a, a soft diplomacy effort, uh, some Dutch archaeologists undertook a single season uh, survey in the area. And amazingly, they published it in 1999. Uh, I think that surprised so, everyone so much that most archaeologists don't even know this survey took place. Um, so it was quite new, but luckily I stumbled across a copy of the survey and I was digitizing the site, so I was adding in all the locations they put in. And they recorded this field system. Uh, they couldn't give a precise date, but they thought probably um, late South Arabian or something like that. And what, from an aerial perspective, as a, using remote sensing archaeology, what piqued my interest was this mountainside here, and you probably know from the poster of, the, um, of this talk, this this structure here, which they didn't survey, and this isn't to diminish what they did, it was their third season, and like most projects, they tend to follow the wadi systems rather than climbing up this very 
high mountain that's probably very hot uh, and probably inhospitable to them. So the fact they missed it shouldn't be a point of shame. The fact that they did the survey and published it in one year is amazing in itself. So I noticed this slide, and it was spectacular. We're looking at a very dense settlement with a rampart, possibly with an earlier stage or an inner core of that settlement. These dense clusters of kind of rectangular structures with these courtyards. Dating, talking to colleagues from other missions who have worked on the ground in Yemen, uh, particularly Jeremy Shitgat in the CLRS. He would guess at the Bronze Age stage, but again, with the remote sensing data, we are guessing at this stage. We, are, we have a low certainty in terms of whether that's the date. But still amazing. This is not unlike the Fort the Fog was showing you. It's a bit like they decided they weren't going to live here anymore, and they left. And again, because of the, the low level of modern intensive agriculture and the fact that it's up on top of a hill in a sparsely populated area, it's meant that this site has survived perfectly in many ways. Perfectly. So I became interested in this area and I started looking further south across the lava flows uh, on, on the border region with Alveda. And we started finding more of this. And this again is just a snapshot in terms of a massive landscape of archaeology. It probably continues into the kind of sites that the Chicago uh, School of Oriental Studies was finding further to the west. And again, we see these same kind of rectangular structures, less of the coherence that we see. Uh, with that last settlement, it wasn't kind of as picture perfect, but in terms of numbers, this is just one snapshot, an area maybe a kilometer wide, but this continues across a vast area, um, and it's taking a very long time to unpick this, try and disassociate it from modern field systems, and understand what is really going on here. If this is Bronze Age settlement, it's kind of at a level uh, of density of settlement that hasn't really been seen in this region before. Uh, if you'll, a paper published by us in the preceding seminar of Arabian Studies in 2017 showed some of our work building on French research in Alveda further to the east, but we weren't finding anything quite like this. <coughs> Another thing that we were seeing and continues further on in other areas, these kind of dense, almost regular cairns, these mounds of stone, probably burials, not really being seen in this kind of organized fashion on this scale before. This is a plateau only maybe two kilometers west of the site I just showed you. And these, these occur again in much smaller scale all across this region. As you move further west, you get a lot more intensive agriculture. <coughs> um, and so you're, you're seeing them a bit less. But again, this is, this is new in terms of uh, documented sites for the region, in terms of being known to science. Also note these, these long walls cutting across the site. Again, we mentioned this in our uh, <coughs> seminar of Arabian Studies paper, that we're starting to see these long walls that aren't just field systems, they're, they're cutting across whole landscapes, and amazingly when you think of the long walls of um, the United Tribes in Socotra. Mm. And again, here are these walls again, and, and what's interesting in this region is they also start to form root rays, uh, again with even possible phasing between the root rays, sometimes linking up, here you see a, a much less well-defined settlement. Uh, and again, we're having to pick that apart and try and understand it in the context of where areas have been destroyed by more modern agriculture and settlement. So we're talking about a whole landscape that, although Yemen is in its current situation, certainly no international archaeologists can work on the ground. It's very difficult for any Yemeni archaeologists to work on the ground. And for all the kind of the negative things that we're seeing, hopefully our project is building a data set that, that when people do go back, when people in Yemen are able to start working on their archaeology and they can have this data set to work from, they know immediately where they can go to. In the past, there have been interna international missions working in Yemen, but they've always been very focused in small areas. Again, at the bottom of Wadi, is often focusing on epigraphy, which to us as archaeologists seems um, a little bit conservative. Uh, but that is just the nature of archaeology in the region. It's seen a lack of investment. And suddenly, we almost have too much data. It's dizzying. Sometimes, the way we survey, we'll survey an area and then we go back later to enhance that record on the database. And sometimes you'll come across the most remarkable sites and you think, God, why did nobody tell me about this site? And then you look down and you realize that it was you who'd surveyed it and just forgotten because it was just, you know, really is uh, a wonder in terms of what we're able to document. <coughs> Another thing that we've done as part of our project, and again building on David Kennedy's work, which um, Bob mentioned before, 
which tried to bring together historic aerial photo collections, even those that weren't taken in order to identify our cultural sites as a means of understanding landscapes since uh, changed or, in some cases, archaeologically destroyed. Um, so we've been working, for instance, with the Bodleian Library. They have a large collection of both the RAF mapping photography uh, of the Aden Protectorate from the 1950s through to the 1960s, uh, as well as the um, Department of Overseas Surveys um, work in the Yemen Arab Republic in the 1970s. And so we've digitized that collection. We now have it uh, in a digital format, and we're slowly adding that photography to our database. So if you have access to the database, and access access to photography. I've also done a kind of a deep dive into other types of earlier uh, data sets. So we were fortunate enough to find this um, 1934 survey of the western side of um, the Abyan region. Uh, again, where the RAF were trying to map it at that period, particularly as British forces were suddenly, with the arrival of the Royal Air Force, were suddenly able to penetrate the interior of Yemen uh, much more effectively. Uh, so this is about 8,000 photographs that we've digitized and that will go onto our system. <coughs> and this can be very useful. Here's an example with this you know, fantastic school of photography from a um, uh, Farnborough airfield. Uh, where these were all published and actually nearby is where we found them uh, lost in dusty boxes. Um, so for instance, this, this image, it's been drawn on because they're using that to literally try and work out uh, the contours of the site by hand. There's something called the, the Arundel method. Uh, looking at this particular region, pre-focusing, we can see the settlement area very similar to some of those Bronze Age settlements I was mentioning before. This is the very north part of uh, that survey area, Napia. Yeah. Uh, and then the modern satellite image shows that, again, a very small-scale quarrying episode has largely just destroyed that site. So just using modern satellite imagery, uh, we've identified that site using this historic imagery that we're pulling together and making open access in the way Acquired by uh, Arcadia, it will, will kind of open up these regions to new kind of research, not only to archaeologists, but anybody doing geographical research uh, across Yemen. We're also bringing together some of the, the kind of more personal collections. This is from uh, John Salt, who was the, uh, the research officer for the Air Survey Committee uh, um, in the UK. He briefly went out to Yemen to undertake a triangulation process, but while he was there, Took, this, uh, took back a number of photographs, including this um, fantastic photo of Shaban. Uh, you can see part of the wing mechanism here with a leaning out of the airplane. Um, and again, these can be used to start to understand how much of that site has changed over the last nearly 100 years, not quite. We'll get there soon. Um, and again, this imagery where we know the geolocation will be made available for our database. Quickly mentioned, through Bob, we have uh, access to a new, because we also made a uh, kind of, we're trying to find collections that people who've worked in the region have brought back themselves. Uh, through Bob's work, we were able to get access to the Thomas Donald McLeish collection. Uh, he was working with uh, the Royal Navy Air Service in during the First World War. This is a shot from Egypt, but he also took a few shots, uh, or surviving shots from Yemen. This is, again, I don't have my notes, so this is Labay, not the Hudeida, Labayba? Lahaya. Uh, so this is the site in probably 1917. Uh, note that at that point it still had a fortified wall around it. In terms of things to notice, the castle, the mosque, and possibly a small barracks. Southern air, uh, it is the southern end of the site. Going to a modern image, trying to recreate that perspective with Google Earth, we still have the castle, the mosque, possibly parts of the barracks, but that probably mud brick town wall has since gone. So. Sometimes these can really give a whole new perspective on sites uh, in terms of heritage animals that are coming from the <clears throat> And again, this is actually a, a shot. We got this shot at first, and we know it was somewhere in Yemen. Uh, and we didn't know what it was at first. And we were looking at this thinking, what's the funny shaped cloud? But obviously, he's working with the Royal Navy Air Force, and they're undertaking bombing runs. Uh, so this is actually the explosion of a bomb against missed quite badly, this fort site uh, on the top of this hill. We're not sure exactly where this location is yet. We're assuming somewhere along the Tiana Plain, but it's possible, actually, it could be more towards Aden, where um, the Royal Navy Air Service were. So if anybody recognizes it, speak to us afterwards. Yeah. No takers? Uh, and finally, finishing on, what's the way forward? Obviously, we're producing all this data. We want it to be open access. We want people to take it forward, even if I had 
as much research funding as I wanted and as much time as I could possibly have, I couldn't even make a dent in some of the data we're linked together. So we want other researchers to come and use it. And as Bob said, with, through the Cultural Protection Fund, we are able to uh, fund training with uh, members of the General Organization of Antiquities and Museums. Uh, we'll be running that in late June. In terms of taking a version of our database, mirroring it and customizing it for the use of the go around so that they can have this list of sites, but they can also monitor the use, the condition monitoring elements of the database to continue their work in the region after we've gone. And that's kind of the idea of the project. Although we're bringing all these skills into the region, we want to pass them on, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we're not really needed anymore. It's a ridiculous thing to say, but that's kind of where we're heading. And anyway. You're trying to make us redundant. Yeah. I would love to be redundant. There we are. All right, thank you very much. Um, now, how are we doing? Can you manage some dessert? It'll only take 10 minutes. He lied, knowing it's going to take 15. Um, but two things Michael mentioned. One is the amount of data. And it reminded me of one of the pioneers of air photography, uh, Professor J. K. St. Joseph, who founded the Cambridge Committee for Air Photography. And for many years, they worked in Denmark. And they were invited back each year to take aerial photographs in Denmark. And then one year they weren't invited. And a bit crestfallen, he rang up and said, why don't you want us? And he said, and the, and the Danish authorities said, too much data. We don't know what to do with all the photographs and all the archaeology discovered, even in Denmark. Um, and that's one of the issues that we have, is just this huge amount of data. The other thing that Michael mentioned was, in a way, the complementarity of techniques. And a lot of people now talk about satellite imagery replacing everything else that's done. And then LIDAR, the laser scanning, will replace everything else that's done. And then drones are going to replace everything else that's done. And field surveys are going to replace everything. Digital photography will replace everything. And it's not true. They're all complementary. Everything will help to everything else. And that leads me into the Aerial Archaeology of Man project, because why would we want to get in helicopters and fly in Oman? Well, the truth is, it's got to be fun, hasn't it? Um, the second thing is, it's, it's a way of being able to get another layer of information we could never otherwise have. And uh, this is, in a sense, a joint project with uh, Sufjan Al Kramer, who is Jordanian Dutch but works in Oman. And he heard about us and he heard, knew, knew about the Aerial Archaeology Project. And he, and he um, talked to me and said, Would I be interested to set up a project in Oman? And I said, Yes. He managed to get the permissions we needed for one flight in 2018. And so what you're going to get in the next 10 minutes is, we've gone at quite a pace already, I know, even faster pace through Oman. Um, and until January 20, when did I go? January 2018, I had never been to Oman. I knew very little about it. Um, and what we decided to test the technique there, knowing it would be successful, um, but you never know what the pilots will be like, you never know what the aircraft will be like, you never know how you're going to be feeling, you never know whether you'll be allowed to go in certain places. So I just said to the uh, archaeological colleagues in the Department of Antiquities there, let's just look at a series of sites uh, from the airbase that we're flying from down the coast and back again with a view to just testing the technique, which is what we did. Um, and come to amazing sites that the pilots find. Whenever you fly, pilots say, Bob, you must, must see this. And I say, is it archaeology? No, but it's interesting. <laughs> um, and I think you've been there, haven't you, Trish? Did you go to that? No. So you did. Um, and there are some people, if you look very closely, you can't see them, but they're swimming in this sinkhole. Um, I call it the Venice sinkhole. Somebody else said no, it's called Majlis Al Jin. Every archaeological site in, in any country has at least two, two names, if not several more. Um, so if I get some names wrong, do see me afterwards and say the proper name is this. Um, and as Michael's already hinted in Yemen, and obviously Yemen and Oman are the same piece of geography, if you like, um, castles everywhere. I discovered when I went back to Oman in 2019 that there are something like 5,000 castles and towers in Oman. Now, I think the department wants us to photograph every one. I will be too old. It will never happen. So you've got to choose which ones you might photograph or not. And I have to say that I think the Omanis look after their cultural heritage and their archaeology really well. It's been very, very impressive. Um, and so here's just a number of castles. 
And of course, to an ignoramus like me, seeing these castles that I'd never seen before and understanding a completely new culture uh, was, was uh, absolutely fascinating. And then, of course, the more you look, they're not all beautifully isolated like that. There are many of them uh, nestled in developments and other mud brick structures that are probably related. So it is, a, it is still a changing environment, and a rapidly changing environment, and has been for a number of, uh, a number of years. So some of this isn't necessarily modern, but some is. Um, if any of you know the name of this site, I've made that up. Um, uh, we, well, somebody sort of gave me a hint, but uh, this was the most staggering site. Um, even just flying around it made you dizzy. And actually, I meant to tell you that at lunchtime I went to the moon in a virtual reality thing down in uh, near King's College, and that makes you dizzy as well. Uh, do look it up, it's great fun. Um, and Anthony Gormley thing. But as we were orbiting this, I couldn't believe just how vertical that is, but there's an archaeological site on top. So if any of you know more about it than I do, none of the archaeologists in the department knew about it, um, because at the end of the season we go through all the photographs and say, what's this, what's this? And most of the time they go, boom, boom, boom. Um, and that's a more detailed view of it, and this screen is a bit bright, and that's an even more detailed view. It looks to me like it's a huge bath for a very important person. <laughs> but I can't really put that in the record, can I? Um, but there is an argument that there's a site at Petra that is a huge bath for a very important person. So why not? Um, the weather's nice. What a great place to wander around and have a bath. Um, and then other sites that you'd want to record, and what we try and do is uh, and part of the monitoring thing is to record sites we know about. This is the World Heritage Site of Kalhat. Kalhat. Uh, you can see it there. It's very difficult from a helicopter. Helicopter pilots want to do two things. Fly very low and very fast. And I have to say to them, you're going to be disappointed. We want to fly very high and very slow. Um, so to get them to go high, you can see even though we went as high as possible, there's still a bit of the helicopter in there on my foot. Um, because after a while they say, no, I, can't. I, I don't want to go anywhere. Um, and sometimes, although we've got zoom lenses and things, sometimes you do want to get the whole site in. Um, and then other times, hopefully, you want to go as low as possible and get the detail. So it is, and, and this is the uh, uh, mausoleum of Ibn Mariam, uh, where Ibn, Bad, Ibn Battuta visited, um, and that's the port there, the port developed on the east coast of Arabia, 11th to 15th centuries. Um, and that really was the teamwork uh, very important in 2018. Um, so Amira gave us all the points. She's the archaeologist. NASA is was our Mr. Fixit and an archaeologist. But in Oman, apparently in the civil service, you can go off and do something entrepreneurial for five years. And he's now got a um, coach company taking people, workers down uh, to Salala. So he may or may not come back. He seems to be doing very well. Uh, myself, a pilot, Sufyan. The other pilot, uh, Waleed, also worked for the department and the crewman. Actually, no, that's the wrong way around. You know, they've all got helmets. Yeah, I think he's the crewman. And that was in a Puma aircraft. So the next year when we went back, uh, I said, well, where, what happened to Puma? And they said, oh, it's unserviceable. Uh, it doesn't work. So you, you'll either fly an NH-90. Um, I've forgotten what NH, NATO Helicopter 90. Um, I think the 90 is for the 90 million quid cost to develop. And then the Super Lynx built by the Brits. And when that was first introduced quite a long time ago now, it was the fastest helicopter on Earth, which is good. Um, and so we were in two different, and, it's, and it was useful to, to experiment with different helicopters. As it happened in this one, which we used on one of the days in 2019, we had a British pilot. And having worked for 25 years with Jordanian Omani pilots, it was fantastic, they were brilliant. But the difference of working with somebody who knows exactly what you're going to say before you say it, we actually did three hours photography in two and a half hours because he knew exactly. It also helped that they had a GPS. So the communication between us and the pilots makes a huge difference. The drawback of the links is that it needs to be refueled every one hour, 45 minutes. And so we kept landing at this army base and what they didn't tell us was that refueling was by hand. <laughs> so it took 45 minutes to refuel it rather than the 20 seconds it should take. But those are, those are small things. And in 2019, um, we had many, 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 many more sites. Uh, but we did three days flying uh, in, a, in a larger area. We came across one interesting difficulty, which was apparently we could only work in, in particular governorates at any one time. 
And I discovered this at 6 a.m. on the morning, the first morning. They said, oh, well, you can't do this site. There's a really good site I wanted to photograph down here. And they said, oh, it's in the wrong governor. And I said, what do you mean the wrong governor? We're in a helicopter. There's no boundaries. And, they wouldn't, and, and the archaeologist said, oh, no, we've only got permission to fly in this, in this area. Um, by the next day, I managed to overcome that. You might see here, food will become a fish restaurant. Yes, we found a very good fish restaurant. Um, and, and I just happened to leave the GPS on. And then when I came to download it, I thought, why have you gone around that roundabout? Oh, that's for the fish restaurant. So if you're, in, if you're ever in Nassau, there is a brilliant, it doesn't look like anything much, but the fish is fantastic. Um, NASA, who you saw there, he ordered four and a half kilograms of fish for lunch. I thought we'll never get through this, but we did. Um, and then the next few pictures, really just because this is the dessert, um, so amazing uh, sights that we see, uh, an incredible fort here, Mazip, I don't think I pronounced that, Mazahit fort, um, and other sites, huge number of cans, huge number of burials. Um, and one of the problems that we have in, in archaeology generally is we find an awful lot of the remains of the dead and none of the living. So where were all the people living when these burials were being made? Um, I hope you can answer that question. Um, I put this one on because we flew up the coast and what really impressed me was that flying up that uh, eastern coast was just how much infrastructure there is for very small scale fishing. And I hope sustainable fishing and I hope an industry that will continue. But you never know, do you, with, with the, usual, the usual progress that we tend to do, which is to go from small to big and then realize that by the time you go to big, you destroy everything, uh, so you need to go small again. Um, and then food is an important thing, important to keep the team uh, happy and well fed. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it can affect poor old Sofian. I did ask him whether he minded me showing this, and I did show it uh, last year. And so, how do you measure success in aerial archaeology? Is it the number of hours? Is it the number of flights? Is it the number of photos taken? 3,349. And guess who's got to catalogue all of those? Over 160 done so far. It's a beginning. Um, but to me, the, the measures are the new sites discovered, and one of the things that we were trying to do always in Oman was look at sites we knew about and see what was new around them, and, that, and those, so those two things worked out really well. We hope, um, well in fact, no, I've signed, I signed an agreement with the Omani um, Cultural Heritage Department for another three years. Um, they said they can get the permission to fly with the RAF. Uh, the, uh, for a man, so we're, we're ho hopefully that we will be able to continue for at least another three years. So, as with Jordan, if there are any people, anybody in the audience who wants to get in touch with me and have got ideas, not sure why that's dropped off the end, it should be UK now, um, ideas about sites that you're working on or interested in or areas you're working on, we will try and include it. What I think they would like, you know, man, is for us to do what we did in Jordan, which is, we, we published a book, David and I, called Ancient Jordan from the Air, that's what it's called, isn't it? Um, Asian, and to do something similar for Oman. So that's something that might be a good thing for me to do in my retirement. Um, I have to thank all these people, um, because without that, it is teamwork, it takes a lot of organisation. Um, I left it a little bit late, because we got permission to go there, the permission arrived in an email on Christmas Eve. Well, funny old thing, I wasn't reading my emails on Christmas Eve, so it was early January. Um, and I just want to finish with this slide, uh, because I know you want to do some questions and we're going to be kicked out in 15 minutes. Um, this is what we used to use in both the Heritage Lottery Fund and the English Heritage, um, and it's known as the Heritage Cycle. And Paul Collins from the Ashmolean liked it and said, can I borrow it? And I said, yes, and then he put a picture of fur in the middle. And I said, oh, can I borrow your slide? It's better than mine. But the words are the same, and it's about understanding, and if you understand what you've got in terms of the cultural heritage or archaeology, um, then people will value it. And the value can be a whole range of values, including economic value, and if you value something, then you'll look after it, you'll care for it. And if you care for it, you'll enjoy it. And as you can see, we enjoy what we do, um, and people enjoy visiting sites. And then if you're enjoying it, you want to understand it more, and hence the cycle goes on. So that's what we think we're involved in. We tend to be at this level and this level at the moment, um, and it's for others to carry on and do that, but we think <coughs> at least we need to start at that point. So I think that's where I finish. It is. Any questions?